how is it that we are going to experience our greatest life and our greatest destiny in this life? And the Bible tells us. This is Genesis 22. Now, this is a story of Abraham and Isaac. You remember God came to Abraham and told him to lay down his son Isaac. Uh, Abraham and Sarah were 100 years old when Isaac was born, and they were incredibly wealthy people, and they did not have an heir. Real, real serious dilemma for Abraham and Sarah. So here is Isaac born to them uh, at 100 years old. Now, Isaac has grown now to maybe 10 or 12, 13 years old. We don't know exactly how old he is, but he's old enough to go on a trip with his dad, and God is speaking to Abraham to sacrifice him, human sacrifice, Genesis 22, 1. It came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now we're gonna to skip to verse 10. Abraham has laid him down, he's about to sacrifice him. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the ladder, do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, or Jehovah Jireh, some of you know. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Now, God blesses Abraham here, and we're gonna read about that in just a minute. Well, now this is a crazy story. So God shows up, and he says to Abraham, who's waited 100 years for this son, I want you to kill him. I want you to take him and offer him up as a burnt offering. And so Abraham obeys, and he takes, takes Isaac up. And you would say, well, why, why would God want Isaac? God didn't want Isaac. He wanted Abraham back. See, what's implicit in this story is, is that Isaac has now become the focus of Abraham's life, not God. And Abraham is coming, God is coming to Abraham and saying, I was first. I had your full attention until he came along. Now I want you to lay him down. It's a test. God knows it's a test. Abraham does not know it's a test. As far as Abraham is concerned, he's about to kill his son and sacrifice him. He wants, he wants Abraham back. Okay, listen to me. Here's the dilemma that God has. Who can God bless and the blessing doesn't replace God? Here's God's dilemma. Who can I bless abundantly and you won't turn it against me? And Abraham has been blessed abundantly, but what's implied in this story here, and the only, re the only way it makes sense to me is now there's some competition going on between Isaac and God. And God wants to clear it up. He doesn't wanna kill Isaac or have him killed. He just wants to know Abraham's heart and he wants to make it very clear. I'm for, I was first in your life and I wanna be first in your life again. There was Karen and I, I told you we had a life group in Amarillo. Uh, I, I was not pastor of the church. We were members of the church and I worked for my mom and dad. And we had, our group started out with 14 people. One of the original uh, couples in that group were precious people. They were the first people on our porch every Wednesday night and they were the last people to leave. And every week when we had our prayer time, we would go around and everybody would share prayer needs. And the man uh, of, the, of this couple, every single week, he said, I need y'all to pray for my business. He was starting a business. And we were about in our mid-20s. They were in their mid-20s. And he said, I need you to pray for my business. And every week he would share challenges they were going through and difficulties they were going through. And we prayed for his business. So his business became successful. After a couple of years, when we would go around in the group and say, can we pray for your business? He would say, no, my business is doing phenomenally. Thank you guys for praying to him phenomenally. Then, then they started skipping the group. We didn't see him as often and they started skipping church. And I started hearing some, some troubling news about him. And so one day I took him out to eat lunch and they were a precious, precious couple, hungry and humble and just wonderful people. And I took him to eat lunch, and so we met for lunch, and I walked in. I hadn't seen him in two or three months. You know, I just, they, they hadn't been around. And he was a different person. I don't know, I mean, he was just a different person. His complete countenance was different. Arrogant and worldly. 
And he walked in, he sat down in front of me. I, I had been his group leader, you know, for several years. And he sat across from me. And I was, we talked, small talk for about 30 minutes. And I said, hey, I asked you to eat lunch because I'm worried about you. And when I said this, he went, you worry about me? What are you worried for me about? And I said, well, it just seems like your business is taking you away from God. He was furious at me. He got up from the table. I never saw him again but he divorced his wife shortly after that. But I remember, I remember, I remember all of the Wednesday evenings when he asked for prayer and we prayed for him. And the very thing that God gave him is the very thing he used against God. 